Rated M for mature. Who's a good boy? You are. Yes, you are. Stupid dog. argue your ear off about which one should go first. At your service. I've noticed that many people react badly when I tell them about my dietary habits. And yet they have no issues eating animals. Ephraim's blessing. Leave me alone. I don't have time for this foolishness. Now come along quietly, and we won't have to get rough. Brother, I think she's telling the truth. I'm not going anywhere. Now back off before I do something drastic. She doesn't have the scar. What? Oh, you're right. We've made a mistake. Now move along before the of yours gets you into trouble. Next time you're looking to someone, make sure it's the right person. Hmm? Foreigners, what a nuisance. They thought I was some other Red Guard woman. They just wouldn't leave me alone. I hope they get lost in the wilderness. Nords are so serious about beards. So many beards. Maik thinks they wish they had glorious manes like Kajit. Maik is very practical. He has no need for mysticism. Maik is tired now. Go bother somebody else.
What did the Bosnia get when he came home late for dinner? The cold shoulder. <laughs> Need a ride? Where do you want to go? Climb and back and we'll be off. First time to Solitude? Beautiful old city. Capital of Skyrim, but I'm sure you already knew that. Why is it called Solitude? It's such a sad name. They should rename it Friendstown or Comradeville. Hmm? Hello?
crush the target and bite their legs to hold them still, or I shoot them for the mask. Don't worry, I won't hit you. I am an excellent archer. <sighs> all right, all right. How about you charge the enemy, topple them over, and pee on their face? Then I shoot them with an arrow. Good talk, my friend. Good talk. Hmm? I took a piece of burning bone from our fireplace, and I swung at the hover with it. They scattered, screeching. But as I swung, I lost my grip on the torch, and it fell into the dry leaves below. It took the tree things two days to get the fire under control. Hundreds of trees burned, and I heard their screaming within my mind every time I closed my eyes. I fled. I fled, and I didn't look back.
Hello? Here I am. That's why I came to Skyrim. That's why I cannot return. Because although I miss my beautiful home, my kin, my family, dearly, there's nothing left for me there but regret. I broke the pact. I betrayed Ifray. And so I'm condemned to fade into the darkness once I die. My name will be forgotten. Erased. And my song will be forever silent. Better, thank you. I haven't talked about what happened in Valenwood to anybody else. It feels like... It feels like a great weight has lifted. Thank you. Thank you for understanding. But my people wouldn't see it the same way, I think. In their mind, my sister's death would probably have been a fair sacrifice in return for the safety of the forest. People do crazy things for the ones they love, hmm? Oh, more than anything. I imagine she hates my guts, though, making her an accomplice to my crime. I'm... I'm very lucky to have you, yes? You really think so? <laughs> well, let's get moving, shall we? We've worlds to save and bandits to eat and all that. I prefer not to kill Spriggan, but they seldom leave me any choice. They're as vigilant about protecting their home as I am, and I respect that.
Spinners, priests of Ifre, are said to be able to change the past and predict the future. I wonder if my mother could do that. How can I help? How can I help? Yes? Who's a good boy? You are. Yes, you are. In Valenwood, Spriggans uphold the green path. They are an important part of the balance. Thank you. 
Time to die. the boss get when he came home late for dinner? The cold shoulder. <laughs>
Yes, my friend. You're so noisy in that armor. I realize it protects you and all. Could you try not to attract every bandit in Skyrim? If you need me, I'm here. Hmm. Oh, I was just admiring the color of your eyes. They're really quite striking, you know? When the light hits them, they're like deep pools. Did you know the tip of your nose wiggles when you speak? <laughs> <laughs> it does. And when you're concentrating, you get this adorable wrinkle right between your eyebrows. Some. Mostly when you think nobody's looking. I enjoy the small nuances in your expressions. The way you speak volumes, even when you say nothing. Maybe. But don't let it get to your head. That proud expression is making you look constipated. I'm glad to see you. Oh, Ifre. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was just thinking. Do you know about a place called Evergreen Grove? I camped there once, after I just arrived in Skyrim. It's a place of very simple beauty compared to all the gorgeous places you've taken me to. But I'd like to see it again. Do you think you could take me there, if we're ever in the area? Thank you. Certainly. I'd love to. What would you like to hear about? Many years before your time, and many well before mine, great creatures walked the surface of Nan. Where they came from, none could say. After a time they faded and vanished, all gone away to the lost corners of the world. All save one. A great beast made entirely of bones did burrow a writhing path through the ground, Named the destroyer by those who survived his passage. Though none could say where it went or what drove it, all knew the barren swaths of land in its wake. It is said the destroyer's coming could be felt as a calling of the sod a full day before its arrival. When it arrived in a place, the great beast would writhe about, shattering walls and toppling buildings. 
cliffs would turn to slurry in the great quakes brought by its pursuit, and many a pod home burst beneath its bones. It did so until it found men or mer who could answer its question, for the destroyer would always question its victims. The oldest accounts of these questions were all variations on where can I find the old bones? The canniest of those asked would point in a direction deemed most expediently away from and least destructive to the remaining homes. As the destroyer searched, evidently in vain, its questions changed. As it neared the end of its rampage, it was known to ask, May I sleep here? It has been so long since I slept. The only one known to answer yes to this question was the tree thane of Falinesti, the walking city, knowing Falinesti would soon move on. From where it wintered in South Point, she convinced the destroyer to sleep in the bows of Arborfell, an orchard known for its abundance of bats. Here, the Ephra priesthood planted a blessed seed in the skull of the great beast as it slept. This seed soon grew into a sapling. The sapling into a great tree, and the great tree into the barrow bow. The bones have not stirred since. In the ages following the destroyer's final rest, ancient bones have sometimes been unearthed throughout Valenwood. Though silent, these remains are brought to Arbethel, now the Bone Orchard, in hopes that they will always remain so. This tradition has spread throughout Valenwood. Bosma far and wide have taken to burying the bones of their loved ones in the shade of the barrow bow. Here they believe Ifre will grant his blessing, a final sleep for the lost. Certainly. I don't know. The penalty for breaking the green pact is death. It's not something that's just forgiven. Certainly. My father was a hunter and my mother dabbled in priesthood. Both of them spent most of their time alone, so it was mostly me and my sister. What about you? What was your family like? Oh, I'm so sorry. Certainly. I'd love to. What would you like to hear about? In Morrowind, there was a nobleman by the name of Kelmeril Bryn, who had a very definitive view of how things should be done. Whenever he purchased a new slave, he had them whipped in the courtyard for one to three hours. Few slaves ever had to be whipped more than once. As the memory of the first day and the sights and sounds of other slaves' first days stayed with them throughout their lives. When Bryn bought his first Bosma slave, he ordered his castellan to whip him only for one hour. The Bosma, which Bryn had named Dob, seemed so much more delicate than his other slaves. He was clearly not suited for work in the fields, but looked presentable enough for domestic work. Darb did his work quietly and tolerably well. Bryn occasionally had to correct him by refusing him food, but the punishment never needed to go further. Whenever guests arrived at the plantation, the sight of the exotic and elegant addition to Bryn's household staff always impressed them. It was during this time that Bryn decided to take advantage of Dob's skills in archery and ordered him to tutor his son, Wadelik. For the first few days, the master watched Wodelik and Dob to be certain that the slave knew how to teach. 
He was pleased to see the boy learn the grips and the different stances. A month later, when he came once more to check on his son's progress, he saw Dob guiding Wadilik to shoot his arrow up into the air, high above the targets. What nonsense is this? Bryn snarled. What about accuracy? You haven't taught my son a single thing about marksmanship. Dob bowed humbly. Sidura, first Master Wadilik must become comfortable with the weapon before he need worry about accuracy. We learn this by watching the arrow arc in different winds. Bryn's face turned purple with fury. I'm not a fool, he raged. I should have known not to trust a slave with my boy's education. The master grabbed Dob and shoved him toward the plantation house. Dob, head down, began the humble, shuffling walk he had learned in his domestic duties. Wadilik, tears streaming down his face, tried to follow. You stay and practice, roared his father. Try aiming at the target itself, not at the sky. You are not coming back into the house until you do it. The boy tearfully returned to practice, while Bryn brought Dob into the courtyard and called for his whip. Dob suddenly broke away and scrambled to hide between some barrels in the center of the yard. Bryn began to bring down the whip down on his exposed back again and again. Wadilik's miserable wail drifted from the courtyard. I can't, father. I can't hit it. Master Wadilik, Dob cried back as loud as he could, his voice shaking with pain. Keep your left arm straight and aim slightly east. The wind has changed. Stop confusing my son, Bryn screamed. You'll be in the sultry fields if I don't beat you to death first, like you deserve. As Bryn's whip rained blows down upon Dob, Wadilik's arrow sailed high before coming down in a magnificent arc. Bryn tasted the blood before he realized he'd been hit. Gingerly, he raised his hands and felt the arrowhead protruding out of the back of his neck. He looked at Dob crouching under a wagon and thought he saw a thin smile cross the slave's lips. Just for an instant before he died, Bryn saw the face of an untamed wood elf on Dob. Bullseye, Master Wadilik, Dob crowed. Gotcha. Hello? <clears throat> How can I help? How can I help? Certainly. I'd love to. What would you like to hear about? The spinners tell of spirits to whom this land belongs, and who belong to this land, if they belong to anything. They are our ancestors and our governors, our conscience when conscience fails, wisdom for foolish elves. We may pretend to live apart from them, but it is only a child's tale, made of childish dreams. Certainly. I'd love to. What would you like to hear about? There is a story that my mother used to tell me when I was a child. I remember it well. Once, there was nothing but formlessness. The land held no shape, the trees did not harden into timber and bark. 
and the elves themselves shifted from form to form. This formlessness was called the ooze. But Ifre took the ooze and ordered it. First, she told of the green, the forest, and all the plant life in it. She gave the green the power to shape itself as it willed, for it was her first tale. The elves were Ifre's second tale. As Ifre spun the story, the elves took the form they have today. Ifre gave them the power to tell stories, but warned them against trying to shape themselves or the green. Shifting and the destruction of the forest were forbidden. Instead, Ifre commanded the wood elves to the green, so that they might ask the green to provide them with shelter and a safe passage. And as long as they respected the green, it would obey. This is called the Green Pact. Finally, Ifre told of all the beasts that crawl on the land, or swim in the rivers, or fly in the air. These Ifre gave to the wood elves as food. They were to eat no plants, but consume only meat. Ifre also told that no wood elf who is struck down by another wood elf should be allowed to sink into the ground but should instead be consumed like the beasts. This is called the meat mandate. When the stories were told, Ifre saw that they had a pleasing shape, but some of the ooze remained. Ifre told a final tale then, and gave purpose to the ooze. Any wood elf that violated the green pact, either by shifting or by damaging the green, would be condemned. Condemned to return to the formlessness of the ooze. Their names would be scrubbed from the story Ifre is telling and replaced with silence. Gotcha. Here I am.
Should I hide from it? This is my family's legacy. It's the past. past Dead old years. You've been at my side, and I think I barely know you. What's to say? Hey, what are you doing? Joined the Legion when I came of age. I don't buy all that talk about ship captains having to be stern and strict. I want my crewmen to enjoy their work. By inheritance, as my men are fond of saying. Can't blame them. My mother ran the sea squall as strictly as she ran the house. I've been trying to find new areas of business. I'm trying to win the sailors' respect, but I keep having problems. Take the last trade we did. Some fine-cut void salts from the College of Winterhold. Plenty of coin if you know who to sell it to. Stupid dog. Your choice, friend. All right, then. Stupid dog.
I can take you to any port on the coast. Where are you headed? All right. Thank you. 